How did right. you learn that? Great camera trick. You know, I, I had these cameras a long time ago, so uh, that's uh, I'm very tech savvy. I like uh, all these little things that come out all the time. You know, I was the first guy with a fo voice dialer, all the way in Japan, in '94. I had a, like I, I would say home, and I push on the phone, and go, doo -doo 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 -doo, and all these fighters go like, oh my God, that's unbelievable! I say, you watch in a couple of years, that's building into a telephone. No way! I say, I guarantee you, it's going to be in a cell phone. And sure enough, it's there. Well, you know, you had the joy and luxury of living in Japan and fighting there back in the day, and uh, really making a name for yourself. And I remember one of our previous interviews, I was actually surprised that you were doing broadcasting and not fighting. And now, of course, you've become ten times as popular as a broadcaster as you are as a fighter. What's it like being a super? star now oh I don't know about superstar you know I'm, maybe I'm, I'm a known guy in the mixed martial arts world you know and uh, well actually the movie here comes the boom we got a lot of kids following me also that's so that's pretty cool but it, it's cool it's cool you know it, when I started commentating I had no clue you know I, I I always tell people first time I commentated I didn't bring a suit and they they're in Japan they go like you didn't bring a suit I said no and nobody told me to bring a suit they said well, I was in my flip-flops and shorts I said, are you serious? I said, yeah, I'm serious. Nobody told me. I had no clue. A commentator, you know, I think, oh, it's a sound. We're not going to be on camera. So that's why we came up with all these weird, sorry, with these weird little openings at the Pride Fighting Championships. Me sitting with all the geishas, you know, but I was just because I had no suit and we had to come up with something else. You know, Back in the Pancrase days, you were such an incredible fighter, and you took on anybody, you know, some of the longest, most incredible fights that took place back then, really legendary mixed martial arts fights. What was it like letting it go and, and, and stepping into a totally new career and dominating that? You know, it, it was the weirdest thing. Mwah. It was the weirdest thing because I, um, you know, I had to let it go because of injuries. It started to hurt so bad, like I had tendonitis in both arms, and yeah, no cartilage on the kneecaps. So there's a lot of things I did, but the tendonitis in my arms was killing me. And if that would happen, let's say, four weeks before a fight, then I would two times a day, or ten times a week I would train. Ten times a week would be, after 45 minutes of training, would be an insane pain for an hour and a half. Like pain that you can't do anything about. You can't take pills for it because then you can't fight. You know, and you couldn't sleep. I started losing weight from the pain. I couldn't eat. You know, it was a, a bit, training became miserable. So then, to step away from that was not so bad for me. You know, when I made comeback in 2006, I didn't train for seven years. Well, I didn't train for five years. Uh, and, and, and then I, when I started training, I, I felt great. And that's why I said, oh, I'll take the fight. You know, but then three or four weeks before, all the things started coming back again. So that was, for me, the sign I had to stop it. But, you know, to stream over into broadcasting, what came by accident, I didn't even know there was a top ten list. When they called me after the first year, they said, hey, man, you're the number one color commentator on the list. I go, there's a list for commentators? I have no clue. You know, and that's... Uh, I was just lucky. Every time I had the right spot, the right place, like I always say, like they're up in the sky there, marionetting me around. You know, they say, oh, it's a career ends, let's put him into this. Oh, this has a TV show. Boom, first MMA show on TV, you know, inside MMA. We're almost seven years. We did almost 350 shows. I see commentating, then the show, then the movie. Everything just falls into my lap the whole time. It's uh, I got great guardian angels, I guess. You know, speaking about marionettes, we spoke about it back in the day, your legendary sixth sense, your ability to know when knockouts are going to come, what techniques are going to come, just the intuition you have from having grown up around the gym and being heavyweight UFC championship fighter. Are you still in touch with that? Do you still feel like you're you're one of the fighters or the coaches right right in there in the cage? Yeah, no, well, once I start coaching and I really, with somebody, with Dwayne, I had a a lot, you know, and Genki Sudo and a marker, you know, all these guys when I was there and we would really train together, they didn't lose, you know, and uh, we had a really good connection. And now, unfortunately for them, you know, I, I got just way, way too busy and I, I couldn't do it anymore. Now, thankfully, all three are also uh, retired. But that, that, that was hard for me also because, you know, a certain moment you have to go like, listen, I never asked money. You know, I, I'm a marker, I never asked money. Like Dwayne Luther, Dwayne would give me money. I would, he would say, I oh, know, but I want to pay. I say, just give me a check so I can take my wife out. And then I say, I know you need it. Why would I take money from that? I know how hard, how hard it was when you're a fighter. So it wasn't for the money. It was just for the love of the sport and what I like to do. And, and, and especially if you have a guy like a Dwayne, you know, yet you just say, right straight liver, and he throws it one second later. He throws that combination out, you know. Now you now you get really interested because that's a guy who listens, you know, and I, I predicted like three knockouts with him literally in the dressing room 
do this and you're going to knock him out with it. And he would knock him out with it. You know, with the fast knockout with Goulet. I was hanging over the cage and every time I, you will hear me say, I say, Dwayne, I don't know why, he's coming straight at you, just move to the right, catch him in the right. You know, and sure enough, he comes running in, boom, and he drops me. He said, oh, yes, I have no clue how that is, but... You know, I, for some things, I, I feel that's how I got the commentating job. You know, just watching fights in the background, when uh, in the in the backstage, uh, on the TV, when uh, Marco, who was was there fighting, I was in his corner, I was his training, and Marco Kerr, and I just saw a fight. I said, "Oh, he's going to give him a right armbar," and he go like, "What?" I said, "No, check. Wait, just wait. There we go. Uh, yeah. Oh, you see, there we go." So they go like, "How do you know?" I said, "Well, you can tell. You know, he said the way he sets it up. That's how he got the job." They said, literally, said, "Oh." Did you ever do commentating? No. Do you want to try? And that was in 2000 when the Pride went to on pay-per-view in America. So you see, every time I just I'm there. I'm I'm blessed. You really are, and your timing in the sport was impeccable. Why is it so hard for so many fighters to get out of the sport and and to retire at a at a timely age? You, you know, because it's it's a it's a feeling. I always say that you you can't you can't get anywhere else. It's an uh, the training. It's, I miss like my knees are so painful. If I would roll, and now with my arm, I have no power in my arm. But then you know. It, that would hurt for five days, so I can't do it anymore. But that is something I really miss, just the ground fighting. Because with ground fighting, every day when you roll, something new comes. You go, to, oh my God, I never knew that, you know. And or a new submission, or a new counter, or a new setup to a submission, and a new a new escape into a submission, and it, like all that cool stuff. And it's the same with sparring, you know, with, uh, with with standing. And that I really, really miss. And also to be with my students and say, okay, let me show you how to do this. And now I can't really show it anymore. Because you know, I'm. I don't even want to be in there because I'm going to give a, the wrong image off. You know, not. I'm. I'm a shade of what I was. I'm still powerful, and I have that. That I have. But, you no, know, just the right arm is hard. I was talking about it with Randy the other week. You know, the reason why he retired so late was he was still achieving technical perfection and excellence as a ground fighter in his late 30s. Mm. What was it like for you giving up the game and 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 moving into commentary? You know, also, Randy is a smarter guy than I was. You know, I, I was an, an, a, a guy... We spar two times a day full out. That's how we trained, you know. And and Randy knew already. Oh, we can't do that. We gotta, you know. So he he worked. I was more injury free than I was. So uh, that that I think helped him a lot as well. That's why he could kept continue to fight. What was the second question? Everything back then, you know, you did it yourself. You had such a such a strong regimen in terms of running and in terms of the technical jujitsu. I remember one submission. You literally got it off a television screen the night before. It, uh, a tournament in Japan. Yeah. What was it like training yourself and and being in the sport at the early age when really uh, the rules were different, when everything was different? It was an eye opener for me. For me, it was a must. I I just lost, and and I'm a very bad loser. And the last time I lost with Ken Shamrock, that really made me getting vocal, and I got the 